Hello, and welcome to the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. Each episode, we talk about a particular topic in the life of a professor. Ruth is a visiting professor at a large university in Ireland, and Claire is an associate professor at a primarily undergraduate university in Northern California. The purpose of our podcast is reflection, so we bring something we think is working and something we're working on to discuss. Welcome to the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. I'm Ruth. And I'm Claire. And today we're talking about disambiguation of academic professor jobs. Uh, but first, Ruth, how was your week? Well, I'm so happy that it landed that you had to say the title because <laughs> I'm not sure I can say that word. Um, so, yes, my week was good. It was, um, well, yeah, more more p- p- like COVID exposure stuff. And so the girls ended up home from school for like a day where they really, they weren't sick. Do you know what I mean? But I just was like, oh, I yes. don't know if they're going to show up as having COVID or not. But they were so bored. They actually Aww. ended up, they like had a funeral for their toothbrushes that I had tried to throw out. Like, and I was just like, this is genuinely like, it kind of just made, you're like, how did we ever get through the pandemic? Do you know what I mean? Like one day and they're having this like really ridiculous. I just found the gravestone actually. Oh my goodness. For uh watermelon and peaches which was the name of the toothbrushes anyway um <laughs> i love it what yeah, did they so make the like, gravestone wow. out of it was made out of lego uh-huh. and then it was like in the because i was like what is happening over anyway it was it was a gravestone so um <laughs> but they had written a handwritten <laughs> but anyway man these kids like i think most parents will know the misery of trying to throw things out without uh, them knowing about it. Mm-hmm. But I didn't anticipate that the toothbrushes, I thought the excitement of the new toothbrushes would um, soften the blow. <laughs> of, like, And I actually, by the way, I have changed their toothbrushes regularly before. This hasn't happened. So it sounds like I've never gotten the new <laughs> toothbrush. But um, yes, so that was one thing. And then the other thing I wanted to share was, um, I think I've told you about my daughter's obsession with pigs. Mm-hmm. Like pig. Yes. So... She got pig fairy lights, or what do you do? You call them those, like okay. lights on a string, like a bunch of yeah. lights separated by little spaces on a string. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but like the world is so sophisticated now that the pig lights are on a timer, so oh, they wow. come on for like six hours, and then they go off for another twenty four hours or whatever, like whatever. But anyway, it absolutely terrified my eldest daughter because she was in bed and the pig lights came on all by themselves oh my goodness everybody out so i was cursing the pig lights because um they prolonged bedtime by quite a bit because everyone got freaked out by the spooky pig lights <laughs> i was even a little until i realized what was going on i was like why did the pig lights go on? so yes <laughs> yes that, that's, that's been... interesting too sophisticated why would you need pig lights on a timer well, apparently to scare your children, so that's why. But um, how was your week? Oh, my week was good. Um, as you know, because I already texted you about this, yesterday I was working on a figure for my paper and I had this moment of breakthrough because mm. I'd had this figure, and I'm sure you've, you've had this situation too, where it's like, it's you know it's not the right figure. It's complicated. Everyone has trouble figuring out what the heck you're trying to say with it, but you can't really figure out how to do anything better. And then yesterday I just like was like okay let's figure out what would be a better way of doing this and I I just you know sketched things out with pencils being like would this work what about this and then eventually was like I think this might work and now I feel like it's problem solved the figure's not confusing anymore so that was really exciting dude I salute you because it's so hard sometimes once you see something one way yeah do you like because sometimes do you know when you're talking about writing and stuff and sometimes people are like oh just put any old stuff down on the page and then you can edit it. Mm-hmm. And like, I totally believe that. And I know that's true. But then sometimes you just get stuck with the thing. Because yes, it's like, you do. when you put your, when you unpack, when you move into a house and you're like, throw stuff in one cupboard. <laughs> and then it's like, well, that's where it just always was. I, so uh, yeah, exactly. I find it really hard to reimagine things sometimes. So I absolutely, that's, I mean, it's great that it worked out. And then I extra salute you because you already had this figure. So sometimes you're like, well, that's the figure. That's just what I know, you know. Because it was, it was, yeah, I know what you mean, because it totally was the way that I was used to looking at the data. But the thing was that we were kind of seeing an unusual, like unexpected thing. So the way we had designed the Mm. experiment didn't show us the thing that we'd hoped it would show us, but Mm. it showed us this other thing. So the the graph that I had was based on the original idea of what we were going to see, which we didn't see. So it was like really confusing. 
because it was like, why are we looking at, you know? So anyway, it definitely did take a reimagining of like, what if we were actually trying to see this thing that is what we saw? <laughs> How would we plot that, you know? Um, That's awesome. So today we're talking about a lot of academic professor job things. We wanted to disambiguate mm-hmm. a bunch of things. We wanted to talk about some the, some of the different roles. And um, so anyway, I have a quote, and it's... Um, it's related in the sense that I thought it was really inspiring thinking about if you're like at a job interview or you're going through the job hunt process and like just a, a, a mindset approach. So this is from the book, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. George Clooney spent his first years in Hollywood getting rejected at auditions. He wanted the producers and directors to like him, but they didn't and it hurt and he blamed the system for not seeing how good he was. Everything changed for Clooney when he tried a new perspective. He realized that casting is an obstacle for producers, too. They need to find somebody, and they're all hoping that the next person to walk in the room is the right somebody. Auditions were a chance to solve their problem, not his. From Clooney's new perspective, he was that solution. He wasn't going to be somebody groveling for a shot. He was someone with something special to offer. He was the answer to their prayers, not the other way around. The difference between the right and the wrong perspective is everything. So I just thought that was helpful, you know, really thinking about, I mean, when people are looking for jobs, someone's really looking for that right person. And so focusing on how you are a special, exciting person for them, and you might be that one that they're looking for, rather than hoping they'll give you a shot, I just think is is a really good mindset. That's, I think that's amazing. And I think that's huge, because I think there's something too about like coming from academic stuff like you've just gotten your PhD and you really are in a position which you can reframe that for sure but you really you're kind of like looking to people like as they're the experts you Mm -hmm. know what I mean and it's so hard then to go into a job interview when you're like please like me but it's so I mean and not even from a confidence you should get this job sort of thing but you genuinely do need to kind of go in like you're evaluating this situation too and Mm -hmm. whether it's going to be a match for you and now, having been on the other side of the table, you're totally right. Like, you really are like, please let this person be amazing. And like, you want, you're not looking to trip them up necessarily. Like, right. you want to give them all the opportunities to be the best person totally. for the job. I completely so, agree. Yeah. yeah, and I love the word match you used. I always think of it that way. Like, we're looking for a good match for you, and they're looking for a good match for them, and we're trying to see... Yeah. I am totally <laughs> quoting you. You, you, I won't quote you, you're the one who always says that, but yes, um, I'm going to just style it it's out. Totally like, yeah, that is a, that's a really smart thing I said. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we, like, we have an old episode about applying for jobs. We do. Yes, that we, um, but I think we're going to say lots of that stuff and new stuff today, because mm-hmm. I think we have had many thoughts about it since then. So totally. um, I think part of the thing we wanted to talk about was sort of advice for people who are applying for jobs. And then another big thing we wanted to talk about is just the nomenclature. Did I say that word right? Yeah. The labeling of job titles, because it's really, <laughs> really confusing. It's really confusing. And every, every country seems to have its own mm-hmm. thing. And I think one thing that does seem like, I think America is uniform in what it is its job titles which is not true in Ireland Mm, for sure and I'm sure it's not true throughout (laughs) Europe so yeah it's really it's tricky and confusing because um yeah so how will we talk about that yeah well let's start I think we're going to be focusing on the American nomenclature but we'll mention if if sometimes something is is notably different elsewhere or we want to yes um contrast it I don't feel confident necessarily no, commenting yeah, on that's, exactly. yeah, because it is all different, but yeah. So I guess okay. maybe we want to start with disambiguation with job titles. And I really want to highlight mm-hmm. there's all these different adjectives that you can put before the word professor, and they mean very specific things, but they're, I don't know, totally abstract. And uh, if you don't know what they mean, they sound very similar. So I think the big category difference here is that there's the tenure line positions, and then the non-tenured positions. And usually, you know, there's plenty of good reasons to when the non-tenured positions might be what you're looking for, but usually if you're looking for a career in academia, the thing that you want is usually the tenured positions. And so usually those start out assistant professor. You don't have tenure yet, but you're on the tenure track. 
you are a tenure line faculty member, and you're, the plan is that you will apply for tenure. So assistant professor is usually the first job you get as a professor on the tenure track. And then usually you get tenure around year six or seven, and then you become associate professor. And then a few years later, you can go for being full professor. We say full professor, but usually just means there's not an adjective in the front. You're just professor. First you're assistant professor, then you're associate professor, then you're professor. Or maybe you say full professor. And then sometimes there are a few other ones, like um, some universities have distinguished professor, and just a few no. of the top university top professors. Oh my are god, I've never heard this before. <laughs> oh no, oh, but my PhD advisor my mind. <laughs> was wow. distinguished. And then there's also endowed professor, and so that's like oh my god. Um, that's kind of a different category. That's like if you um, if somebody donated a bunch of money to the university and created mm -hmm. an endowed professorship, it probably has that person's name, and it's um, it's um, got a little bit of prestige associated to being an endowed professorship, um, but other than that, it's it's the same general category as you're, you're in the tenure professor category. What is the word for when you're retired? Is Emeritus, it, um, you're right. Emeritus. Yes, that's another okay. one. So that's, okay, but that's like you're still affiliated with the university in some way, but you have, you're not like full-time working there. Yes, yeah, you've retired, okay. you've already gone through, you know, not not everybody goes through all the, all the stages. Um, but mm. so you can go from assistant to associate with tenure and you could just stay associate professor for the rest of your career, or you could go up for full professor and become full professor. And then at some point you retire and yeah, maybe you become professor emeritus. And that just means you're not really doing all the things anymore because you're retired, but you're still associated yeah. with the university in some way. Yeah. So those are all the tenure line things, um, that I, that I can think of. <laughs> Yeah, and so because I did not get this at all. So tenure line is basically meaning it's a job with the potential to become permanent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you will become, so there's three legs on the ladder and you'll become permanent usually after the first one. The thing that absolutely melted my brain was that tenure is not necessarily connected to promotion. Mm. So promotion is going up through the list of, but tenure can be separated from those, but isn't usually. Um, yeah, so usually you come in as confusing. assistant without tenure, and then you get tenure and become associate. But sometimes maybe you already had experience somewhere else, and you come in mm -hmm. already at associate because you have so much experience, but they didn't want to give you tenure yet because you haven't worked there yet, and they don't have enough experience with you. Yes. So you're associate without tenure, and then later you get tenure. So, so you're, you're right, there are some some odd exceptions like that. Yeah, and then will you remind me, let's come back to that the whole getting years of service when you get ah. a job, because we should talk about that for a minute. But then, yes, so the other type of jobs is the non-tenure track positions, mm -hmm. which um, are, there's a few flavors of that. And yes. I don't necessarily understand the distinguishing things between them. So sometimes people are called adjunct mm -hmm. faculty, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's called being a lecturer. Mm -hmm. And this is what is really confusing, that until relatively recently, if you were like a full professor in a lot of European places, you were a lecturer. Yes. Like maybe it. So that's really confusing. So, so that's, yeah, if yeah, you're applying. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, so that's an important distinction in the U.S. Lecturer mm -hmm. means non-tenure track. You're, n you're not so you're, you're not going to go up for tenure. You're totally just on a non-tenure track position. You're usually teaching and doing service. You, you might do research, but you might not. It's usually not part of the job. So that's that's what a lecturer is in the U.S. But then, yes, in the U.K., lecturer is their word for tenure track things. So that's that's a different that's a different yes. thing. So and when you apply for a lecturer position, often it's a one year contract, but you can in some institutions, it can evolve after a certain period of time to become a three year contract. And then I think there is places where this is a bit confusing, where you can kind of become tenured, like a permanent member of staff. But it seems like in a lot of places, it's considered a different job. So you're not necessarily having research or like you said, service requirements. Um, I don't know, is there a difference between adjunct and lecturer? Yes, I think so. Oh, I, I do okay, think I do think there's a little ambiguity in like different universities do different things. But mm -hmm. my impression is adjunct can be more part time. Like maybe it's like oh, like not a full time load. Yeah, mm -hmm. it could be. It, like it seems like maybe you have the local um, 
you know, chief of police come in and teach a class on crime solving or something. And his actual mm. job is being chief of police, but he does come in and do this class. And so he sometimes mm. that person might be called an adjunct professor, um, which, of course, is different than a lecturer who maybe is teaching a whole bunch of classes or, is, or as many as, as is available that semester. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's visiting professor, which seems to be like, again, there's a, little, there's a little bit of variation, but that seems more like you probably have a position somewhere else and you're here for a year teaching or something at this university. Um, or, or sometimes you can be hired as a visiting professor and, and um, you don't have a position somewhere else, but probably you're hoping to get one. Either way, adjunct professor, visiting professor, lecturer, instructor, those are all non-tenure track. Again, there's probably times when they're fantastic choices, but, um, but usually if you're going for the career in academia, you want the tenure track positions. Yeah, and the visiting professor, um, like that's, again, like that, but that does seem to have research and service requirements, or yes. definitely research requirements. So I think if you're going on your journey and you are hoping to get a tenure track position and you see a visiting p- professor position come up, that can be a good thing to do. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it would turn into a tenure track position at that institution, but it can be really good experience if you're trying to leap, you know, into a tenure line position. It seems like it's, I think it's also worth mentioning that, um, you know, if you're going for, and this is maybe getting into what we're going to talk about next is the different type of universities. But if you're, mm-hmm. if you're going for a research focused tenure track position, you need to be doing research. And so sometimes taking a visiting professor position that's really teaching heavy or something like that can make it really hard to keep the research going and that can be a problem down the road so I would maybe encourage people to do more research stuff postdoc-y things instead but if you're going for a more teaching focused position you really do need some teaching experience and so that could be a good a good step in that direction too yes totally sorry what were you going to say no I was actually going to say the exact same thing so um, and then I was going to say So, yeah, we should tell our uh, loyal listeners that even though the Internet is a wonderful thing, sometimes the connection between Ireland and the West Coast of America is giving us weird overlaps. But um, yeah. And then so very broadly speaking, I guess there's three main types of institutions in America. So there's the R1 universities, which are research and PhD granting. So they're kind of definitely a different flavor. Then there's the... Um, four-year colleges or PUI, so primarily on un- primarily wait primarily <laughs> undergraduate <laughs> institution. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then there's also community colleges and Good point. Um, yeah. So yeah, and I think the biggest piece of advice that I would offer um, from this episode would be to be very aware of what the institution you're applying to is. So yes. if you are applying to a PUI or a community college and you are talking about all of the research grants you're going to get and all of those things, you're really not going to be an attractive candidate. Do you know what I mean? So being aware that, so how would you kind of, I don't actually know what the breakdown is. So all I know is for a PUI, we have a reasonably heavy teaching load. Um, As a lecturer, you would have a full-time teaching load where all of your hours of work are dedicated to teaching. And then if you're a tenure line associate or assistant professor, then you have a certain teaching load with like a chunk broken off for research and service. But um, at an R1 university, is it way more, what, what do you know? Tell yeah, me. yeah, I would say so. So um, yeah, if you're on a tenure track position, assistant, associate, full, any of those, um, that almost always means that you have some combination of your job is teaching, research, and service. Those are the three pillars. And they're what you're going to be evaluated on for promotion. They're just what you're expected to do. Those are the three categories of work that you're expected to do. Now, the balance between them varies. And yes, at a research-focused university, the research is going to be uh, a bigger chunk of your time than the teaching, whereas at a PUI, the teaching is probably going to be a bigger chunk of your time than the research. Now, in all the cases, you're going to be doing all three of those, but it's the balance between them that changes at the different places. And so, yeah, exactly as you were saying, Ruth, if you're applying for a PUI, I mean, all the research stuff that you've done is epic, but you should really start mm-hmm. out with your epic teaching thoughts. And if you haven't got teaching experience yet, you can still say, here's, you have tons of experience being a student, and you can talk about 
You are teaching philosophy what you really think works, what you would be excited to try in the classroom, stuff you've read about teaching. All of that is still fair game. And then you also mention all your research and how you can involve students in it. Now, if you're applying for a research-focused position, I think you start right out with all the research awesomeness, and then the teaching stuff you still mention, but it takes more of a back seat. But that was one a really good piece of advice that I got um, from a friend when I was applying was... Really, like if you are going to talk about your research when applying to a primarily undergraduate institution, like there was someone I met once and he was like, basically like no undergraduate would ever be able to do anything in his research because it was too advanced. And it was like, yeah, that's not what you want to say. So you want to make it really clear, like what are the access points for students into participating in your research? And it would definitely have much more of that focus when you're talking about it, for yes, sure. Yes, totally. Um, and and I'll, yeah. I'll throw in too, like, so my research is, it's really easy to contaminate the samples if you don't know what you're doing. So it, um, so I explained that um, I, I, I came up with some projects that could be entry-level projects that students could yes. do without worrying about contamination and explained how awesome those would be. And then I also said, and we're going to still have some, um, you know, once they've developed skills, they can move into these other projects. And so it, it just thinking about it through the lens of how can this be a teaching opportunity? How can I do it with undergraduates? And really sh- throwing that forward, um, I think, is really important when applying for those those PUI positions. Yeah. And I think I just want to come back to what you said as well about um, if you don't have teaching experience. And so I think like especially if you can when you are doing your PhD if you do have just have it in your head that you may be applying for a teaching position at some point and taking those opportunities a to like do teaching assistant work for sure but if there is seminars and anything happening in your department that is about like education research stuff Mm -hmm. or you can even go and engage with the like most universities have some version of a center for teaching and learning And if you can take part in any of those things, all of the things that basically, I don't know quite how to say this, but sometimes it's quite clear that the teaching is very much something someone is willing to put up with so that they can do their research. And even if that is secretly true for you, that's not the way you want to portray it in your application materials. So any evidence that you have that you really have read about these things and thought about them. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially knowing some of the terminology about things, especially around equity and inclusion and, you know, active learning and all of those things. Um, I'm just throwing out words there. That's very shallow. But you know what I mean? Like really those having topics, evidence though. that you have yeah. engaged with those things. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think is super important. Um, yeah, if you don't have teaching experience... And especially if you're applying for a teaching focused place, yeah, go get some. And like Ruth's saying, there's a plethora of opportunities. If you can't teach the class yourself or if you can't be a teaching assistant yourself, which would be ideal, you could still volunteer and just say, hey, can I do a guest lecture here? Or can I come Mm -hmm. to your activity section and just observe or whatever it might be um, just to get your your foot in the classroom and have some some things you can refer to in your teaching philosophy statement. Totally. And then I think it's tricky sometimes for people who are applying um, for positions in America and maybe weren't American students. And so trying to um, just really looking through the university that you're applying to and what kind of courses there is and what the curriculum breakdown is and anything to show that you're familiar with American universities um, would be really beneficial. Oh, that I brings up. Sure. I love that. And I also think it's really helpful if you can look up just a few specific things about oh, the place yes. you're applying for and throw them in there, that makes all the difference. You know, refer to a location nearby that you could do some research, refer to a professor in a different department that you would love to work with, refer to this particular class that they teach that you're really excited about, or this new one you want to develop that you think would build across these particular, like just keep referring to things that show that you have looked at the website and did the best you can to figure out what this university is about. Oh, 100%. Um, Because... And it's true for like everything that like everybody wants to feel a little bit special. And if you're reading all of these applications and I think I have confessed on here that when I was doing my own job search, I definitely at least once used a letter and I didn't change the university name Mm. in all of the places. And it's like, oh, that was the worst feeling. And I'm sure it didn't feel great to read it either. But um, so anything that you can 
make it clear that you are genuinely considering this place Mm -hmm. as like a really viable option. And it's so hard, like, because, you know, and it's a bit like when students are applying to grad school that you do have to play the numbers game in some respects. But if you have a very, very generic letter or, for example, if you're applying for a PUI and you're using a letter that's really geared towards an R1, you know, that's just, it's so obvious that you're not really going to, you know, what I mean? so it's just, you don't even make it into the second round pile or whatever. So really just yeah. making, like you said, making that effort to make it seem mm-hmm. heartfelt, even though I find that incredibly cringeable. Like it actually, oh, really? it just feels like, I don't know. I just felt so embarrassed when I was doing that. Interesting. I don't maybe feel I would that be way. Different now. Yeah, I think now that I've read it, I don't uh-huh. think I would. But I think it felt so artificial for me to be like, mm. I would be, you know, but I think maybe now that I've read them, I would feel this. Like I think maybe I don't feel like it's artificial because, I mean, you really are trying to figure out if this is a good match for you and if it's, mm-hmm. if they're a good match, if, if you're a good match for each other. So you are like, if, if you're genuinely considering this school, you really do want to figure out if it's what it's about and how you might fit in and stuff like that. And so maybe you'd rather do that after you get the job rather than before. But instead, if you do it before, you're much more likely to actually get the job. So that's this. So I guess, yeah, I I recommend applying for fewer positions and really trying to make them be the ones that you're super excited about and putting those little details in there to show that you are excited about them. Yeah. I'm going to reiterate some things I said in the last episode um, which was like, and this was not clear to me at all, but really knowing that making job application materials takes a substantial amount of time. Mm. And often it's like, like something like, oh, like teaching philosophy or the cover letter. Like I'm so deeply uncomfortable with writing that I would always just leave that bit till the last mm. minute, but it's a huge part and it is a big undertaking yes. and really, really, So like, I guess just to summarize what I did and my job search was not super successful. You know, I had a few interviews, but it wasn't like for the amount of jobs I applied for, it was not necessarily. But however, this is what I did. So it seems like there is a season where there's a lot of tenure line jobs advertised. And so I made my spreadsheet, put in the job, the application date. I went and looked up the ranking, which... I don't know if this is what people want to do, but it really helped me have like a more realistic perspective. And it doesn't mean that you are not going to apply for jobs that are like higher up the list, but especially, and I would say this, especially to people who are applying from abroad, it's very hard because you just don't have that experiential sure. knowledge of like, well, no, this college is like, because again, we've done this categorization of three categories. But there's overlap and windows in there where like some universities that are PUI actually do have quite intense research report. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah. you know, top of their field in whatever. So, you know, just, you know, having that. So I looked up the rankings and then but then I really did spend an entire summer preparing the materials mm-hmm. and preparing the statements and then the mortifying bits, but getting everybody to read them. So important. Absolutely so essential, important. even though it's yes. so hard. It's so hard. But um, doing that and like really just kind of and I think in previous times I hadn't sort of weighed it up as like this is a piece of work I am doing. Like Mm -hmm. this is going to be Mm -hmm. a time commitment and it's an investment. So I think that is something um, I think in previous years I kind of was like half heartedly like, oh, I'll fire in my application here and Mm -hmm. there. And I, it's just not, I think you really have to make it like a project that you're going to do I agree. and then be very um, dedicated to it and put in a lot of work. And then other things like preparing your job, if you get interviews and um, preparing for those, but also often you're asked to do like a talk mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So I think those things, again, just acknowledging that they take a lot of time. Yes. And I think, again, thinking about which ones are the most important, depending on, like, like if you're going yes. to do an interview at a PUI, probably the teaching demo 
is more important than the research talk. Not to say you should skimp on the research talk, but you yes. really need to nail that teaching demo. And sometimes I find it helpful to ask kind of what they're looking for and get as much information as you can about the classroom. And are you going to be teaching a bunch of students who are actually taking this class or is it a kind of fake class? Mm-hmm. And that kind of, that just just what are you going to be dealing with and trying to trying to think all that through? And then as far as the materials, I totally agree with you, Ruth. And I wanted to throw in, when I was applying, I... Um, had this wonderful colleague who had gone through the process a few years before me, and she was applying to R1s, but she had um, shared with me her materials, which was very generous mm. and incredibly helpful. And she was she emphasized, you know, hey, you're applying to PUIs. So her teaching philosophy, she said, wasn't the thing she spent the most time on, but I would probably need to spend the most time on it. So she 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 made that clear. But still, looking at her materials was so helpful just to get some idea of like, what kind of sentence can I use? You know, how do you oh, sell yeah. yourself? So if you know anybody who has successfully gone through the process recently, then I would see if they'd be willing to share their materials. And that can be a really great oh, starting point. Totally. Yes. Also, listeners, if you are applying for tenure track positions and you would like another set of eyes on your application materials, I would be glad to be that other set of eyes. Um, you can send your cover letter, teaching statement, um, research statement, whatever whatever you'd like another set of eyes on to our email address, contactprofessorpodcast at gmail.com if you'd like my two cents. Um, and be sure to state what kind of university you are applying for. Anything else you want to hit on, Ruth? I feel like, again, coming back to, um, well, I guess one last thing then is the interview. Mm -hmm. And really, like, because often when you do, often there's like a phone interview, or I guess it's probably Zoom now. Um, Like I said, like an old grandma, (laughs) back in my day, (laughs) who would carry your pigeon. But um, they... So when you have the interview and you go to the campus, yes. that's like such an opportunity for you to really get the vibe of whether this is something you want to do totally. and whether you want to go here. Um, and also bring snacks. If you Ooh. go for an on-campus interview, a friend, a very like who she had gone through the process and gave me excellent advice, which was to bring snacks excellent. because it is the most intense couple of days of your life, basically. And it's just so it's very full on. But um, again, and I was going to say too about the, if you go to a PUI, making sure that your research talk is appropriately pitched yes. because it will be for undergrads and not blowing people away with the awesomeness, but more, how are you able to speak to undergraduates about your research? Totally. And that's not to say that they don't want you to be getting mm-hmm. research grants and bringing in money and doing awesome things. Totally do. But it needs to be clear that you understand that you are going to be working with and communicating with undergraduates. Oh, there was one last thing, uh-huh. which was applying for jobs and then um, kind of getting years of service. Oh, yes. Service credit. Yeah. Yeah, because I had never heard of such a thing. So I guess this is a bit of a side note, um, but when you are applying for tenure, you have to have X number of years of service before you can apply for tenure. So sometimes when you are going into a job, you can make an argument that you're carrying years of service with you. And that could be because you already had a tenure line position, or it could be that you had a lecturer position and you did a lot of service. So, but I think it's a mixed bag. And I think it's very good to get advice from people Mm -hmm. because sometimes you can be like, hooray, I have gotten three years of service, but then you only have two years to do everything that you needed to do to get tenure yes. in the place that you're in. So I think it's just something I had never heard of it and I wouldn't have known to ask for it. Um, but then it's a double-edged sword. So mm-hmm. just being aware of all of the aspects of the decision you're making. So you could have the opportunity to go up for tenure early, but then you need to go up for tenure early. So it's just whether you want to do that and how how and I guess this is what they evaluate when they give you it so I think usually everyone is setting you up for success so it's not really going to be a trap but just to be aware of that it's kind of the same thing where they you know the university and the department is making a big investment in hiring you and they're helping you build your lab and they're um, hoping that you're going to work out and be a really valuable member of the university for the rest of your career. So everybody wants it to succeed. Um, so yes, I agree. They're not setting you up 
So I, having an open conversation about that and trying to figure out whether you want the service credit or not, if you're in the position of deciding, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is definitely something that we would be very happy to talk about more if people had specific questions. So please do, I mean, always get in touch, but if you have specific things that would be helpful for us to talk about, or if there's specific people that we could ask to come on to talk oh, yes. about. So like if you're like, I would like to hear from someone who's working at a community college about, you know, what's going on for them or whatever it is, um, please do let us know. Totally. And I just had one more thought that's I want to add into, <laughs> which is just, I think a great question when you're on the interview is to ask about their RTP criteria. And RTP is mm. um, retention, tenure, and promotion. And some universities and some departments are really explicit about their criteria, and some are a little more vague. And um, so you can find out about that. You can also find out what they are. But you're also asking and showing that you're interested in staying there long term and you're finding out what they would be expecting of you if you stayed there long term. So like one of the things I asked, somebody gave me the advice to ask about RTP criteria. And um, one of the things I asked was, oh, you know, my research is really collaborative. And so um, I, a lot of my papers were not first author because we're doing lots of collaborative stuff and there's only one first author and is that going to be an issue and um, in this particular case the person I asked said are you going to be on the paper are your students going to be on the paper okay then it doesn't matter that's fine now that might not be the case everywhere so um, yeah. anyway that's just an example of something that you can ask about and just see if they're going to be judging you on metrics that um, that you are interested in being judged on <laughs> yes yeah very good yeah Thank you, Ruth. This has been really Thank interesting. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us on the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. We're delighted to have you as a listener and we would love to hear from you. And if you want to email us, our address is contactprofessorpodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear any of your suggestions for future shows or professor quotes that you might want to share with us, or even just things that have come up for you when you were listening to previous episodes. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, we would love if you would spread the word. So the best way to spread word is by telling people you know if you think they should listen to it or you can leave us a review where, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.